All right. So welcome. Uh, my name is Christina Delisio. I'm an economic development specialist in the community development department. This is the what's on the menu, maximizing revenue through menu choice and design webinar hosted by the economic opportunity and development division. The division is housed in the Cambridge Community Development Department and is committed to building an inclusive and sustainable economy in the city of Cambridge. The division is responsible for a wide range of activities designed to meet the city's need for a vibrant, innovative, diverse and thriving economic base that ensures economic opportunity for all. To learn about the division, you can visit cambridgema.gov backslash CDD backslash economic opportunity and development. This webinar is part of the Food Business Incubator Workshop Series, which is a program of our division. In the series this year, we have another workshop coming up at the end of May. It's a free Serve Safe Manager training. Um, we really encourage folks to register for that now if you're interested because space is limited. Uh, once we transition to the actual webinar, I'm gonna go off camera and I will change my name to my email address. So if folks wanna email me questions or want to register now, feel free to do so. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I just want to quickly go over some housekeeping uh, rules about the webinar. So first and foremost, we are recording as of right now. A copy of the webinar is going to get posted to our website. All attendees have probably noticed they are muted and video is disabled. However, the Q&A feature is enabled and I will be monitoring that um, during the course of the webinar. I'll address whatever I can in the moment. And if there's things I can't address or if there's really specific things for our team here, I'll raise it at an opportune time. And uh, since this is a webinar, bathroom breaks, checking on kids, checking on pets, it's all welcome. Please feel free to do so and take care of anything you need to as it comes up we will be able to share a copy of the presentation slides uh, later on. So with that, let's get started. It's my great, great pleasure to have Prep Shift here today leading our webinar. I had the great fortune of working with Irene about a decade ago uh, when she and her siblings had just started the May May food truck. And since then, it has been utterly inspiring to see all the ways that Irene has been a true leader in the local food scene and a unique voice in the broader restaurant culture. Uh, most recently, Irene and her team started Prep Shift because they saw that restaurant businesses weren't getting the help that they needed, especially the ones that really needed help. Prep Shift now offers workforce training, coaching, consulting, and workshops. So tell all your friends. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Irene and her team to more fully introduce themselves and to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. And Christina, do you know if attendees are able to use the chat in addition to Q&A? Okay, got it. So we will plan on using Q&A um, to the fullest. Um, and hello, everyone. I think we're going to share our presentation and hopefully everyone can see that. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I recognize um, a couple of folks in the audience already, which is awesome. Um, and today we are going to be talking about menu design. This is one of my favorite topics and I'm very excited to provide you with some info and then hopefully um, be able to follow up and um, help folks out who are in the process of menu design. So just a couple words about PrepShift. Um, we are a restaurant consultancy and we use a variety of tech tools to help restaurants and their teams get on the same page, which can be really tough in our industry. And we want to help everyone build a profitable and sustainable business. We, um, at May May, my, my other job, we started out as a food truck and then we opened a restaurant. We did catering, dumpling manufacturing. And so I have seen many aspects of food businesses and am excited um, to be able to bring my expertise there. I'm also joined by um, Dylan and Carla who will be monitoring the Q&A. Dylan has a background in finance and consulting and Carla has worked in operations and tech. Um, and I met both of them because we worked together supporting restaurants during COVID. Um, Dylan and I were consultants on a project through Commonwealth Kitchen, and Carla helped me make sure May May survived COVID. Um, and I loved working with both of them so much that we decided to take our collective strengths and create Prep Shift. So we are all really excited to be here with you today. By the end of this session, our goals are to make sure that you feel like you can make data-based menu decisions, know the basics 
costs of costing a menu and feel empowered to improve your business. It can be hard to know when to add a menu item, when to change a price. And so we are going to give you the tools to evaluate questions like those. And above all, we want to ensure that your menu is profitable. Um, you could have the world's best food, but if your menu isn't designed to allow you to be profitable, you don't have a business. You're just a really talented home cook. So our agenda for today, we're going to go through a lot of stuff. And again, as Christina said, um, the recording will be available on the City of Cambridge um, small business page. And we did also want to um, just throw out some questions for your consideration. Um, the first question is, do you know which items on your menu are most profitable? And secondly, are any of your menu items losing you money? Now, the reason we ask this is that a lot of folks focus on growing sales without thinking that critically about whether the food they're selling is actually making them money. So the reason we're here and the reason menu costing and design is so important is that if you increase sales with an unprofitable menu, you actually are just going to lose money faster. Um, and that is a pretty terrifying idea. We see this all the time. It's a very common pitfall. Um, and so we want folks to be able to keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, that's one of the reasons we're talking so much about menu today. So our first topic is menu evaluation. And we want to kind of think about how do we currently evaluate our menus? How do we know if our menu is any good? What are some of the things that we think about when we are thinking of adding a dish to the menu? And there are a few criteria that we often talk about. The first one is concept. Um, you want your food to kind of make sense with the brand and identity of your restaurant. If you specialize in a certain cuisine, um, that can be pretty straightforward. But in general, um, you want to make sure that every new dish fits in with who your restaurant is and who you are as a chef or owner. We also talk about market, which is um, who's around you, what's selling, and at what price. Um, and so doing market research and looking at your local competitors and seeing what kinds of menus they're building can be really important. The next criteria is operations. So does the dish actually fit into the way you run your business and the way you run your kitchen? Um, I see Daisy is here from Breadboard Bakery. Um, Daisy makes amazing breads and pastries. And I know that some of these take many, many days. Um, and so she does an incredible job making sure that all of that works. But those are the kinds of dishes that folks so I want to be careful about um, because if you don't plan correctly, it can really make a problem for operations. And of course, um, we are missing one big piece of information, which is what we're here to talk about, which is costing. Um, costing unlocks all kinds of information, like is my COGS percentage healthy? Is my menu item priced correctly? Is my menu mixed balanced? And does my menu allow me to be profitable? Um, in my experience, uh, number two is a particularly popular question, and this is something that we're really excited to help folks with. And it also relates to all these other questions. So if you aren't sure if you can answer these questions, or maybe even some of the words and phrases aren't familiar to you, that's definitely okay. We are going to go through each of these in some detail. All right, so we're going to talk about COGS. What is COGS? COG stands for cost of goods sold, and these are all of the expenses that are um, ingredients and packaging for the food that you sell. Our COGS helps us figure out how much we need to charge for a dish, and we think about COGS in two different ways, uh, in dollars and in percentages. So if you sell a $10 sandwich, our question for you is how much do you think that you should be spending on ingredients? So take a moment and decide what you think that benchmark is. All right. So there are benchmarks for how much you should spend on COGS. And a benchmark, basically, if you're not familiar with that term, is kind of like an, an industry standard. And as you can see here um, in this uh, dark orange spot, we think the benchmark for cost of goods sold should be about 25%. 
This pie that you see, it represents all the revenue, which is all the money you bring in. And the slices of pie represent what you spend your money on. So for a financially healthy restaurant business, COGS should range from 20 to 35% of revenue. So in our $10 sandwich example, this would mean spending two or three fifty dollars on ingredients. And it looks like our chat is back. Amazing. Um, and Yin said $2. That is right on. Um, so that is awesome. And the reason that we give a range is because COGS and direct labor, which is how much you spend on your team, um, has an inverse relationship, meaning that when one goes up, the other goes down. And so often we combine these two numbers into a concept called primes. So if you have a lot of folks working um, to create uh, your beautiful croissants like Daisy does, um, you might have lower costs and vice versa. And that's something that we're gonna talk about um, in some of our future webinars and something we're happy to talk to folks about one-on-one um, -on -one as well. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how do you actually calculate COGS? This is our pork belly noodles, and we are going to measure and cost each component in the dish. So one thing that can make costing really tough is that our ingredients come in all different units. Um, you can see that the noodles are already portioned, and so it's pretty easy to find out what a portion costs. For the pork belly, on the other hand, the vendor might sell it to us by the pound, but that's not how we sell it to the customer, right? So you might have to do some math to convert a pound into whatever unit you use. So let's say at Meime, when we make our pork belly noodles, we portion by ounces. We need to do a little bit of conversion to get that info. Another thing that can be a little complicated is that we prep and cook the food and sometimes this produces waste or we don't yield as much food as we put in. So you may buy five pounds of Brussels sprouts, but you're not gonna get to serve five pounds of Brussels sprouts. So when ingredients go from raw to cooked, there is some loss. So when we talk about yield, we're referring to how much finished or processed product is left after we do that prepping and cooking. Here's just a quick example. So let's assume that raw pork belly is $6 a pound. And at Meime, we like to roast it really hot um, so that it gets caramelized and delicious. And we actually roast it for at such a high temperature that one pound of pork belly becomes half a pound of pork belly. So that means that we yielded 50%. And so each pound of cooked pork effectively costs $12. Um, and that is very different from $6, right? So we want to keep this in mind when we are doing our costing. Um, and I'd also love to hear in the chat if anyone here has gone through the costing process, maybe you've done a little bit of your menu or your best selling dish, um, but anyone who wants to share a little bit, um, please feel free. And maybe you haven't costed anything on your menu and that's great because that's why you're here. All right. So these are the full cogs of our pork belly noodles. And as you can see, we set the price of pork belly at $12 a pound because we are accounting for the fact that it shrinks when it cooks. You'll also see that we include the cost of the takeout container because that is necessary to sell the food to a takeout customer. And probably many of you are selling a lot more takeout than you have in the past. And we think that that is a trend that's going to continue. Um, this chart looks pretty. Um, Carla did an amazing job designing it, um, but it was a lot of work. And so at the end of the session, we're going to provide you with some more instructions on how to cost to this level of detail. But we know that that's not always feasible. And so just to get started, we've set some kind of goals for folks who are thinking that it's time to cost out the menu. So the first step is going to be to pull a sales mix report and organize it so that the most popular item appears at the top. An amazing start to costing is if you can cost the protein and or kind of the main ingredients of your top five menu items. 
Um, we know that this can be daunting. And so we've tried to help you prioritize by focusing on the most expensive um, ingredients and by focusing on your best sellers. If you're able to do that, you can move on to costing the full recipe. So all of the ingredients in each dish for more of your menu items. And then even better would be if you can do the costing for the whole recipe for at least half of your menu. Um, and once again, you know, going back to, we know you all are busy, <laughs> you have lots going on. And so even if you just know the cost of the protein and the main ingredients in your top menu items, that is a huge investment in making sure that your menu can be profitable. Really quickly, I also wanted to talk about batch recipes because um, I know a lot of folks cook things in big batches, which makes them really efficient. So let's say we were making a batch of pork belly noodles. And if we spent $20 on the ingredients and we made 10 portions, then our COGS is $2 per portion. Great. Um, we also know that when we make portions, um, there is human error involved. And so we want to make sure that our portions are really well controlled because if you batch for 10 portions, but the cook who's pulling the noodles out of the hotel pan only gets eight portions, our COGS goes up by a lot. So now we're going to talk about how we actually determine if a dish can be profitable. And so we are going to move from talking about dollars to talking about percentages. So as you all know, a percentage is about comparing the part to the whole. And we know that our pork belly noodles cost $3.75 to make, and we are going to charge $15 for them. So the COGS percentage is 25. Another shorthand way of thinking about it is that an item's menu price should be about three to five times the COGS dollars. So 20 to 35%, which is exactly what we were talking about earlier. The next question we have to ask is, all right, are high COGS items bad for our menu? That really depends. Um, and now we get into a really fun um, topic that is a couple layers deep into the menu costing process, but I think is really important. And that is contribution. I don't know if anyone here has heard of contribution before when thinking about their menu, but it's pretty straightforward. Contribution is the dollars left after subtracting the COGS from the menu price. And we are going to look at an example. So let's look at these two dishes. Um, we are at a restaurant that serves steak and chicken. And as you can see, the cost of the steak and chicken are really different. The steak costs $15 to make, and the chicken only costs $4. So the menu prices kind of reflect that. Um, the steak is priced much higher at $35 than the chicken is at $16. If we were just looking at the COGS numbers, um, we would look at 42% COGS for steak, and we might say, oh my gosh, that is super high. That's way above the benchmark of 20%. Does that make the steak a bad dish? That depends. So contribution is what we get when we subtract the cost from the menu price. And as you can see, every time we sell a steak, our contribution is $20. And every time we sell a chicken dish, our contribution is only $12. So when we take COGS and contribution into account, um, which of these dishes would we want to sell more of? I'll give folks just a moment to put it in the chat. And I'm sure some people are mobile right now. So if you don't have the ability to jump into the chat, no worries. Okay, so for me personally, I want to sell more of the steak, right? Even though it has high COGS, contribution still matters because as Dylan, who's sitting next to me, likes to say, you don't take percentages to the bank, you take dollars. So when you purchase, um, or sorry, when a customer purchases a menu item that has a high contribution, you're bringing more money to the bank. 
So we can improve contribution by increasing the menu price or reducing our cost of goods. Now, maybe you don't currently sell steak um, and you're thinking, should I be adding some steak to my menu? Um, and what we wanna say is it's not about the cogs or contribution really of any single item, but it's about having a menu mix. That's you know how much of each thing you sell and what it costs, um, a balanced menu mix that helps you achieve your sales targets. It's worth also noting that the cogs of an individual item and the cogs of your overall menu are two different things. And so basically we want everything to even out to have a healthy cogs percentage, but that might mean that you have some items with super high cogs and some with much lower cogs. Um, does anyone have any questions before we keep moving? We're about to get to another one of my favorite parts, which is our star dog analysis. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever um, looked at a star dog chart before, um, but this can be applied. And actually, Yin, I see your question, which is um, Yin asked, will you talk about beverages at a later point? Um, the star dog analysis can be applied to any menu category. Um, and so we'll talk about this as it pertains to some entrees, but you could also perform a star dog analysis on drinks. And Yin, please feel free to throw more questions in the chat um, as we move forward. So what is a star dog analysis? Or for short, we just call it a star dog. Basically, it's a comparison tool that helps us look at our strongest and weakest menu items. And typically, we want to do menu items that are in the same category. So you wouldn't want to compare um, a bottle of wine to a steak, but you might compare different bottles of wine to each other. So to create a star dog chart, we need to know two pieces of information about each item in that category. We wanna know the contribution of each menu item, which again is the dollars that you take to the bank when you sell that item. And we also wanna know how many we sold. So this could be um, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis or even an annual basis. Um, I would suggest looking probably on a monthly or quarterly basis um, in order to be able to make some of the really important changes based on the insights here. And I, um, when I first saw this chart and started thinking about the ways to improve the performance of all of our menu items, I started to be really excited to see the star dog chart every month. Um, and I'm so not a numbers person. So the idea of being like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for the chart to come out um, was, was pretty wild for me. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about how the star dog can actually point you in the right direction with your menu items. So, the star dog chart has a few different zones or quadrants. The first one we call the question mark. Um, the question marks have low sales, but they bring a lot of dollars to the bank. Next to those, we have our stars, which as you may have guessed, have high sales and high contribution. Workhorses are dishes that have high sales, but low contribution. So we sell a ton of these, but they don't bring a ton of money to the bank for us. And then you might've guessed also that our dogs have low sales and low contribution. Um, and this is just what the charts called. We at PrepShift hold dogs in very high esteem, of course. Um, and so our goal when we look at a star dog is to make sure that our most popular best selling menu items are also really high contributors to NOP, which is what we call profit. This goes back to that problem that we see all the time where sometimes a restaurant's best selling dishes, if they aren't profitable, they can actually put the restaurant out of business. So we are going to walk through how to do a star dog analysis. Um, 
This is, again, one of my favorite activities. And so if you are excited about creating your own star dog, we would love to get in touch and talk more about that. The first step is to figure out the cogs of all the menu items within one category. So going back to how we got the cogs for our pork belly noodles, you would go through that process for all of your items in the same category. And if we were talking, for example, about bottles of wine, those cogs are pretty easy. Um, if it's a very involved dish with lots of ingredients, those cogs might be a little bit more difficult. And then the next step is to use the COGS and the menu price to determine how many dollars each item contributes. So again, contribution is menu price minus COGS. Then we're going to plot those items along a sales volume and contribution chart, which we'll go back and look at in a moment. And then we evaluate our findings. So we are going to look at a sample star dog analysis. So as you can see here, we have our contribution on the Y axis going up and down, and we have our number sold on the X axis going from left to right. So if you look up in the right corner, the double awesome, um, that is our star seller. We sell a lot of them and they bring lots of dollars to our bottom line. You also might notice that the way we've set up these quadrants, those green lines, they're not totally centered. And that's because we put the green line at the average of all of the items. Um, so we always make sure that um, we're looking at those quadrants according to how they perform relative to the average. We also have some question marks here. Um, our five spice tofu sandwich and our chicken satay sando. We have a workhorse, our barbecue beef and broccoli. We actually kind of sell a lot of those, but they don't have a very high contribution. And then finally, we have some dogs, our shiitake sandwich and our DD special. So now that we have a sense of what's going on with our menu, we'd wanna ask ourselves, how do we improve dishes that aren't stars? Um, we would love to hear from you about how you might improve one of these dishes. And I will go back to the chart um, and give everybody a moment if you have a suggestion that you might want to throw in the chat. And again, I'm so excited to see some familiar names here. I'm sorry I can't see your faces. Um, we're going to circle back also to, to this part of um, the analysis. So I think we can move on for right now. And we'll give an overview of some of the interventions that we recommend. Um, one thing also to remember is that because the star dog analysis is relative, there's always going to be room for improvement and it might not be possible to get rid of all the dogs on your menu. So let's start with puzzles. Basically, the contribution on these, sorry, or question marks, um, we also call them puzzles sometimes. The contribution on our question marks is actually really good. And so the question for us is then, how do we just sell more of them? One thing we can do is promote them um, on social media, um, with signage. We can also give them a more prominent menu position. Another option is to improve the item's description and marketing. Um, so I'm sure everyone here has experienced that sometimes when you give a dish a, a sexier name, um, it starts to sell way better than it did when you were just describing it very simply. Um, and then finally, another option is if there is an unpopular ingredient in a certain dish um, that maybe is holding people back from buying it, you might consider replacing that ingredient. All right, then what about for our dogs? They don't bring a lot of money to the bottom line and we don't sell that many. 
One thing we can do is rework the recipe to make it cheaper or more appealing. And then the other option is to remove it altogether. Um, it can be very hard to say goodbye to menu items that we love, but sometimes it's the best thing to do to make sure that our menu mix is where we want it. For our workhorses, you don't want to mess with these too much because you sell a lot of them. Um, they're probably a guest favorite, but there are some things you can do to kind of inch them a little bit closer to stardom. Um, one option is that you can bundle them with a star dish. So for every, uh, you know, star sandwich, maybe we add a um, workhorse side dish and that can help us increase our sales. Another thing we can do is reduce COGS or raise the price once again in order to improve the contribution or how many dollars come to the bottom line. And then finally, you can even improve stars. Um, there's always room for improvement. So this can mean um, marketing and promoting. Um, you can increase prices and you can also change the position on the menu. Um, and I want to say that at May May, we improved our stars so much that it made all of our other dishes look really bad. So once again, what we want to make sure everybody remembers is that the analysis is relative. So there's always room for improvement. And again, this is not um, a hard and fast way to decide what to do with your menu, but it does provide some insights. And when we're asking ourselves those kind of tough questions, maybe they're emotional questions, if like we really love that dog dish, um, it helps us um, point ourselves in the right direction. So like I said, a lot of the times we make menu decisions kind of based on our personal feelings or our preferences. And so it's really important to pay attention to customer behavior as it's reflected in the sales data. You might have a few customers that love a dish, but if it doesn't really sell otherwise, it's time to reevaluate. Um, there might be exceptions to this, like a dish that um, is really good for people with certain allergies or dietary restrictions. Um, but typically, we want to make sure that we're considering the data when we're thinking about these dishes. Um, as many of you know, I ran a business with my older brother and older sister for six years, and we never agreed on anything unless there was some data to back it up. And I know that, you know, when you're running a small business, it is so personal. And um, even the small decisions can sometimes be really painful. So we want to make sure that this data is helping us make the best possible decisions. And sometimes that means going against um, how we feel about a certain dish. Um, but hopefully we can see from our analysis that it is the right thing for the business. Just going to pause um, to see if we have any questions about star dog analysis. And hi, Daisy. Daisy made a great point. <clears throat> Specials are tough because customers might not know about them. So time might help with improving sales. Um, Daisy, I totally agree with that. Um, we're also going to talk in just a moment about ways to design your menu to sell the things you really want to sell. So stay tuned for that. And thank you for chiming in. All right. So we're going to move on to menu design tips because we did our star dog analysis and we know exactly what we want to sell. And the next step is to make sure that we really sell them. So we're going to talk first about um, printed menus. Um, probably most of you have a printed menu um, in your business. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about online menus after that. So the first thing is making sure that you guide customers to the dishes you want them to buy, your signature and most profitable items. Um, they should have prominent positions on the menu. And this means in the middle of the menu, at the top of the section or at the end of the section. And there's a lot of research about 
how the order of menu items impacts what people order. And what um, I think people have found is that um, the first and I'm sorry, my notes, the least likely to get ordered is the second to last item. And so if there's a dish that, you know, maybe isn't that profitable, um, but you know you want to keep it on the menu, that can be a good place for it. Research also shows that customers read menus starting in the middle, and then they go to the top right and the top left. And not a lot of places have those big menus anymore, but you can still utilize this info even when you're designing a much smaller menu. Another tip um, is to remove dollar signs from the menu. Again, a lot of research out there that shows that the dollar signs um, are just too much of a reminder that folks are parting with their hard earned cash. And so removing those can also help. We want to be descriptive about what's on the menu, um, especially if you're serving dishes that might not be familiar to your guests. Um, you want to make sure that you are describing everything in a way that makes it sound really appealing. Um, and even if it is something that your guests know about, you can still make it sound extra fun. So one great example here, we work with an ice cream shop in Brookline and they had a flavor called blueberry or they had an add on actually where you could put blueberries in your ice cream. And when they changed it to wild Maine blueberry, both things that were true about those blueberries, um, the sales for those items skyrocketed. Um, I think we saw more than triple. Um, so adding some very uh, select adjectives is hopefully not a lot of work, um, but can really impact sales. And then finally, we do recommend often reducing menu options. Um, I know that we all like to cook lots of different things, but when you have too many menu items, it can create decision fatigue. And that makes it a lot harder for your guests to figure out exactly what they want. Every menu item you have should ideally be unique in its category. So if there are items um, or ingredients that are repeated a lot, you might wanna consider taking those options away. Um, and also if you do have um, a full service restaurant, um, too many menu items can also make your turn times longer. So if folks are spending a lot of time sitting and looking at the menu, that makes everything a little bit less efficient. All right, so next we're gonna talk about tips for online menus. Um, the number one thing is people have to be able to find your online menu. Wanna make it really easy for them to see the menu and place their order from your website. So this can include having a huge link on your homepage to the menu. This also might mean going into your Yelp page and your Google page and ensuring that the order button and the menu button go exactly where you want them to. And I know that sometimes Google will mess around um, with the links that we put on there and that can be super frustrating. Um, but keeping an eye on that is really important. Um, if a customer is having a really tough user experience, um, they are much more likely to kind of throw their hands up and just pick um, someone whose online menu they can readily find. Um, so third-party sites, um, if you have old menus on your website, um, you may have unlinked them, but they can still show up in a search engine. Um, so that's something that you want to look out for because if someone goes to Google and just finds <clears throat> a very old menu of yours, nothing is going to show them that that menu is no longer valid. Um, so that is a super important one. We recommend using real pictures um, and not stock photos. Um, you want your guests to feel like they know what they're getting and like um, you don't want them to feel that there's been a, a sort of bait and switch if what you serve them doesn't look anything like what's on your website. We recommend using images that are consistent. And so for example, using the same background um, in every picture, or if you take your pictures from the top down, keeping that consistent across your menu items. 
Good lighting in your pictures is very important. Um, there is nothing better than natural light. And actually, a cloudy day like today is the best kind of lighting for food pictures. And when we talk about composition, that basically means what's in the photo. Are you really close to the dish? Are you way too far away? Um, typically, we suggest that having a, a full sort of the all the edges of the plate in the photo um, is a good rule. Um, but depending on what the dish is, you may feel differently. Um, again, keeping it consistent is the most important thing. And taking pictures of the food can be a real pain. So if you can't take pictures of everything, focus on the items that you really want to sell, those stars and those question marks. Um, if you take prioritize taking pictures of those, that will be reflected ultimately in your sales. So essentially the message here is that a tight, well-designed menu means easier decision-making for your customers and more streamlined back-of-house operations for you. Um, and Jenny asked a great question, which is, how do you get rid of old menus online? Um, so Jenny, it's going to depend on how your website is built. Um, but if you have access to all the pages of your website, it may be a matter of just going through, oh, on third party. Thank you, Jenny, for the clarification. So how do we get rid of old menus on third party? Um, my guess would be that the most um, foolproof option is going to be to call them. Um, I know that a lot of third parties, it can be really tough to get customer support on the line. Um, I would suggest also writing emails and then just keeping track of all the times that you have contacted them. So, you know, when you get on the phone, you can say, I've sent five emails and none of them have been responded to um, and really just be a pain in the butt. And as Carla said in the chat, um, it's not ideal, um, but it is worth it for your business. And I'm sure we've all had the experience of being a customer <laughs> and ordering something online and then finding out that it wasn't available. Um, and now it's 30 minutes later, you're even hungrier and maybe hangrier um, than before. And so we do wanna make sure that everything online is accurate. One other thing that you might've experienced or, or heard of is sometimes third parties will list your menu without your consent. Um, that has been ruled illegal in some states, um, but it does happen still. And so as Carla said in the chat earlier, it's usually smart to Google your business every so often to see what comes up. Um, platforms like Uber Eats might sponsor ads so that their version of your menu comes up before your own menu on your own website does. And so again, ensuring that those menus are accurate, super important. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Now we're gonna have some fun. We are going to analyze and improve a real menu together. Um, and if you haven't chimed into the chat yet, um, get your typing fingers ready um, because we are going to take some suggestions from you all about how we can improve this menu. So um, this is the scallion pancake sandwich menu at DD restaurant. Um, and as you can see, we have all of those items that were listed on the star dog. This is the star dog chart for reference. And you remember the DD special um, is a real dog and the double awesome is a real star. And then here is our menu with each item labeled. Um, and so we have two stars, three dogs, one, sorry two stars, two dogs, one workhorse, and two question marks. So our question for everyone who's here is, what are some of the things we could do to our menu based on 
our star dog analysis and all of the menu design tips that we've talked about. Okay, Yin made a great suggestion, which is rename the DD special. I love that suggestion. DD, um, I think, doesn't really mean anything to um, the guest in this case. And so um, a new name could go a really long way. And we'll wait for one or two more people to chime in. Jenny said, get rid of the dollar sign. Yes, Jenny. That's such a good one. Um, so we have dollar signs here. And um, again, you know, this is one of those sort of subtle, silly things, but the psychology for consumers um, is uh, such that taking the dollar sign away can make a difference. And I'll have, I'll, we'll wait for one more person to chime in. This menu is making me hungry, you guys. It's good we have lunch after this. Okay, let's see. Ooh, Dylan, look at you. Okay, so Dylan said, the shiitake and five spice tofu might be serving the same type of customer. Maybe we should get rid of one. Um, that is a great suggestion, Dylan. Um, both of those are our vegan items, I do believe. And so maybe we only need one vegan item for our guests. Fabulous. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, so we are proposing a bunch of changes to this menu. The first thing we're gonna do is improve some of the wording. Um, we decided to change marinated chicken breast to char grilled chicken breast. I think um, Burger King proved that um, you can sell anything if you call it char grilled. And then we also are going to improve some of the names. So um, the shiitake mushroom sandwich, we're going to call the Elaine. That's my mom's name. And she actually is a retired doctor and she grows her own shiitake mushrooms. So we're gonna name this after her. And we also renamed um, our tofu sandwich to the Veganosaurus Rex, um, which is you know just something we came up with right off the top of our heads. Um, Dylan's cracking up in the corner over here. I think it's pretty good, but at the very least, it's a little bit more interesting. Um, so that is what we're gonna go with and see what happens. We're also gonna do some ingredient swaps. So if you look at the Elaine, um, before we had a, a sauce on it called sauce grabiche, which is um, French, and not a lot of people know what that is. In addition to that, um, it's the only dish on the menu that uses that. So maybe we could put in local greens pesto instead. We actually have that on the double awesome. So we've eliminated one prep task um, from our prep cooks list. So that's also an improvement, we think. The next thing we can do is raise prices. So you can see the barbecue beef and brock. That used to be $12 and we've raised it to 13. That's going to really help the contribution. And in a case like this, you know, all of these sandwiches are between, they're basically all 11 or $12. And having something that's priced a little bit higher can actually make the other dishes seem a little bit more affordable by comparison. So if somebody's looking at this menu and they're saying, oh, well, I don't want to order the most expensive thing, that might make them feel a little bit better about spending $12 um, and not $13. All right, just like Jenny said, we're going to eliminate the dollar signs. Excellent. 
we are going to eliminate some menu items. So here we got rid of the DD special. Um, Yin, I totally would have renamed it, but the data just said it's not worth it. So we're going to eliminate this menu item. And then the last thing we want to do is center the stars. So the double awesome is our star. We actually put it in its own box and we made sure to tell everyone it's our fan favorite. So hopefully that is going to um, help the double awesome continue to be a star. Now, I don't know how many of you um, are chefs um, and how many of you are more in management or administrative, but I think we made a bunch of really good changes to this menu. And the best part about it is that the kitchen doesn't really have to do anything differently from how they were doing it before. In fact, we actually took work off of the kitchen's plate just by changing the guest facing version of the menu. Um, of course, we want the kitchen to be aware of what we're doing so they can anticipate changes to how things will sell. Um, but if you work with a difficult chef, um, it might be that some of these improvements are really easy ways to um, help make the business more profitable without having to go through a big decision-making process. All right, any questions about our new and improved menu? I also just generally think that <clears throat> Naming a menu item after um, a family member or even after a guest, um, like if there's a guest who really loves that item, um, is always kind of a, a fun thing to do. And then that guest feels like, oh, like this is my menu item. They feel like they're kind of part of the team. All right. So this is the end of our content um, and we have gone through a ton of different stuff. So just to conclude, menu costing is important for a bunch of reasons. It allows us to confirm that our COGS percentage is healthy, that our menu is priced correctly, that our highest contributors are our best sellers. So making sure that those stars are really stars and that we push our question marks and workhorses towards star territory. We wanna confirm that our menu mix is balanced and we want to be sure that our menu allows the business as a whole to be profitable. Um, again, we say this all the time, you can have the best food, and if things aren't priced to allow you to run a profitable business, um, you don't have a business to run, unfortunately. And I think a lot of folks, like me, we get into food because we love to cook. Um, but that doesn't mean that I, when I opened my restaurant, knew anything about how to create a menu or how to run a business. And so this is the piece that, especially for the folks out there who are really talented chefs, we want to be able to bring some of this to the forefront to help with decision making. So we have a couple of wrap up questions. Um, we would love to hear if there's anything memorable that you learned, um, any next steps you're going to take to improve your menu, and then of course, um, any final questions or concerns that you might have. Um, and I see that um, Latoya is here and Lay is here. Hi everyone. And Rachel's here too, look at that. Um, so I'll give everyone just a moment to maybe type in one or two things. And then we have just a couple of last tidbits for you all. Okay, Yin chimed in. Thank you, Yin. 
gold star for performance, uh, for participation. So Yin said, take the dollar signs off and calculate primes. Okay, awesome. And Yin, we would love to help you with that, um, especially the primes part. That's where things can start to get a little bit more confusing. So definitely. And Jenny said, this is helpful because they're redoing their menu now. Awesome. That's great, great timing. Hey, Irene, I have a question if no one else is uh, popping up at the moment. Please. I'll, I'll ask it if there's time. I'm just thinking, um, when is a good time to do menu evaluation? Because I feel like I heard from a lot of businesses during COVID or during other times of emergency where they were evaluating their menu because suddenly there was a very tangible problem in front of them and they were seeing it reflected in their dollars. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, there's probably there's probably some other schedule to get on. There's, I have a sense that it's always worth evaluating at some point, even when things are not, uh, even if it th seems like things are going really good, you know, like I feel like there's this sort of principle if you're out like camping and if you're already cold or if you're already wet, like it's too late, you know, it's, it's like, sort of, <laughs> it's like you have to put the layers on, you know, before you even know that you're cold and like anticipate you're going to get cold. So I'm just curious what your sense is about like what you would recommend for either how often to do this or when to start thinking about it. Awesome. Christina, that's such a good question. So when do we want to do this kind of menu evaluation? Um, we would recommend doing it at least quarterly. And it might only be for your entrees or for one menu category that you're really interested in. Um, and, you know, going back to these proposed menu changes, um, which is slide 51, um, you know, imagine that we made all these changes. Like, wouldn't we want to see as soon as possible <laughs> if it made any difference? Um, and the great news is that it only takes, um, you know, a month or maybe a quarter to be able to see those differences. And, you know, I think a lot of times in restaurants, when we make a decision or a change, we just kind of like cross our fingers and hope that it works. Um, and we don't actually measure it. So it can be really fun to make a change and then look for a measurable outcome. Um, there's also often anecdotal outcomes. So, you know, somebody might say, um, like a staff member might say, yeah, like people seem really interested and they always comment on the name or this ingredient. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, if you ever take breaks during the summer or the winter, um, coming back with menu changes can always be um, good timing so that folks are kind of, they're so excited that you're back, um, that they're willing to put up with some menu changes. And you can also give people a heads up that the menu is going to be changing. So, you know, looking at this menu, maybe we have a guest who loves the DD special and we know we're going to disappoint them when we take it off. So we might let them know, hey, you know, we know you love this dish and we're going to have it for a couple more weeks, but it is going to come off the menu soon. Um, that's also a great opportunity to ask for their feedback on other menu items. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to kind of manage that process. And the other thing I'll say is that you can do this kind of thing incrementally. You don't have to evaluate your whole menu. And um, even something like removing dollar signs, like it's Tuesday, you, you can probably do that in time for service tomorrow. And it's okay to make really small changes. Um, you know, this is all, I think, business of dollars and cents. And so any little change that we can make um, is often um, uh, worth doing, even if it seems really small. Um, and you know, I think the, the boil the ocean metaphor <laughs> comes to mind, which is a lot of times we want to do it right, we want to do it completely, and we want to make sure that it's 100%. Um, but in restaurants, we can't always have that. And so again, small changes are okay. And um, even if it's just, you know, the adjectives you use on your menu, that can still have an impact. Um, that's a great question, Christina. Thank you. And we have a couple questions and comments in the chat. And I know that um, 
Some of these have been sent to just the host and the panelists. So I'm gonna read them out loud in case other participants can't see. Um, Daisy said, loved learning about the star dog chart and I'll keep raising prices easiest with seasonal items. Daisy, that's such a great point. Um, as Carla um, and Dylan said, um, raising those prices um, when folks are less likely um, to be super sensitive um, because they're so excited about pumpkin pie or, or whatever it is, um, that can be a great way to, um, to keep folks happy. Um, and that actually reminds me of another point I wanted to share, which is usually the business owner is the person who is most concerned about raising prices. Um, I think in our heads, you know, we all get Yelp reviews, right? So in our heads, worried about those Yelp reviews that say, um, you know, this business is trying to rip me off. I can't believe I paid XYZ for ABC. Um, but the reality is those are not very many voices in the scheme of all, all of the guests that we serve. And so um, raising prices should be done really carefully and you can do it incrementally one dish at a time. But I think often we have more fear about it than we need to. So if you've been thinking about a price increase would love to talk more about that um, and, and try to give you the, the confidence to give it a shot. You can always undo it later. Um, Latoya said, thank you. Um, she is running a home business. That is awesome. So great to see you, Latoya. You guys, Latoya and I also go back 10 years um, to when Christina was running the food truck program in Boston. So this is a real treat. Um, Jennifer said she's going to take dollar signs off and minimize the menu. Um, Jennifer, that is music to my ears. Um, and as you sort of get things going, you can keep adding menu items on, um, but starting with a smaller menu is so, so smart. I love that. Um, Jenny asked, how do you adjust for and keep up with inflation in your cost of goods? Carla shared an answer to this, um, but essentially, you know, Inflation makes it really tough. Um, and the good thing is that inflation is so present in the news, in public discourse right now, that hopefully guests should understand where those price changes are coming from. Um, and Dylan shared that raising prices isn't the only way to fight inflation. So you could also swap out ingredients, um, reduce portions um, or, you know, tweak portions on different items. So let's say, for example, um, you have a salmon and rice plate. Um, you could switch the salmon to um, a less expensive fish, um, or you could make the portion just a little bit smaller. Maybe you add more rice to the dish. So it's still the same amount of food, um, but you're able to keep the cost under control. Um, and Jenny, I would also just add, for me, um, the way that we've always run Meme is with a, a degree of communication and transparency with the guest. Um, and so Letting people know, um, you don't have to advertise it too heavily, but letting people know why you're making changes can be really valuable. Um, sometimes our guests think that we as business owners are just like raking in the cash. They don't know what it's really like out here, right? Um, and so telling a little bit of the backstory can be valuable. All right, I'll give it just another moment and then we'll head back to our wrap up slide. And we're gonna go to slide 55. Oops. So, um, because we've had so much fun together, we would love to spend more time with you. And did you know that the city of Cambridge provides coaching to businesses um, in certain areas. So um, there's a little QR code on the screen, which you can scan with your phone. And we, as well as um, other coaches and technical assistance providers, 
can help with everything from marketing to financials to hiring and of course menu design we would love to do a menu checkup um, with you especially if you are in the process of updating your menu so you can go to bit.ly slash cambridge coaching or scan the qr code one other thing Dylan just chimed in with is um, when you're raising prices, sometimes you might consider raising them a little bit higher than you think you need to in order to absorb future inflation. Um, Dylan is a finance guy, maybe you can tell, um, but this is a really good point. If you know the writing's on the wall and we think that um, increased prices on certain items are here to stay, um, getting a little bit ahead of that can be really smart. All right. Um, and the Cambridge coaching, um, you are eligible for that service if your business is in an NRS area. Um, there's more detail online about exactly how you qualify for the coaching, but um, this is one of the um, kind of easy shorthand ways to look at it. So as you can see, um, a lot of Mass Ave is on there, as well as a lot of Central Square and some of Inman, I believe. And we also wanted to let everyone know that we have some upcoming events with the city of Boston. Um, all businesses are welcome to join. We are going to have um, a kickoff for a green restaurant series. Um, we're hosting it at May May, which is super exciting. Um, there will be free dumplings, so come on down. Um, you can RSVP online. And that's going to be the first in this whole series about different elements of running a more sustainable business. So we're going to talk about buying local, reducing waste, um, marketing, and a lot of these menu mistakes that we've talked about already. Um, I think we all want to run really sustainable, eco-friendly businesses, but it can be really hard. And so figuring out how to be able to afford um, the values that we really care about um, is something that, that we know very intimately as operators and consultants. And so we wanna bring our perspective um, to support everyone to, to make those green changes that we really wanna make. Um, we also have a number of events coming up with the Harvard Ed Portal. So that URL all the way down at the bottom is the best way to see everything that's going on, prepshift.app slash upcoming events. And one more time, we just wanna say thank you so much um, for coming and spending um, over an hour with us to talk about this topic. Um, we think it's really important and we, we hope that we've given you some great things to think about, um, some actionable steps that you can take. And we would be so, so grateful for um, some of your feedback. We have a survey here. Um, it's bit.ly slash menu workshop, or you can use your phone to scan the QR code. Um, your feedback is what allows us to make sure that these sessions that you come to um, with your very limited free time, it allows us to make sure that these are really impactful for you and for your fellow business owners. So we super, super appreciate it. And um, we look forward to staying in touch. If you're interested in the coaching through the city of Cambridge, um, you can contact Christina, who will pass you over to our colleague Lola. Um, and we would love to get to continue this great conversation with all of you. Um, so thank you again on behalf of myself and Dylan and Carla. And um, I'll throw it back over to you, Christina. Oh, hooray many rounds of applause and thank you so 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 much um i have had this uh webinar topic in my head for a long time now and um i can't think of a better group of people to present it i'm so grateful for your time and your expertise and for your enthusiasm thank you for 
a wonderful webinar. Um, appreciate the extra shout out for our small business coaching program for those businesses that are either already in Cambridge or for people who are Cambridge residents. We really encourage you to reach out and sign up. It's a great program. And I myself am going to try to attend a lot of the other things that you mentioned, Irene. I'm really eager to know more about all the ways that businesses can be green, go green if they're not already there. Um, I think it looks like there's a little bit of stuff that might be coming in through the chat, but um, I think we have maybe one or two minutes left if there's any last bits that you want to address. But um, if not, I would just say thank you again. We'll be reaching out to people by email to share copies of the slides and folks can look for a copy of this presentation on our website later on. Awesome. And we will, I just threw this in the chat too, we will be sending out some additional materials um, and tools for, for helping you with next steps on costing. And um, yeah, thank you all so much again. We'll, we'll hang out for a couple more minutes um, in case anyone has any other questions. Irene, I think one of the things that I was really struck by in this presentation was how much there's so many easy things that people can do right now without even getting into some of the um, little things that can happen, you know, at this moment just to start the process. Definitely. Um, it is kind of incredible that you can make so much change without even needing to have an in-depth conversation um you know obviously you want to keep people in the loop um but restaurants are fast paced and we don't always have time to um to sit down um and really go through things all together um so yeah i think it's really exciting and you know often when I'm going out to eat, I'm looking at a menu and thinking about all the little tweaks I would do. Um, and actually, I went to my friend's restaurant in Quincy recently, um, and I, I, I wrote a new menu for him um, without making any changes to what he has to do, <laughs> only to how it's being presented and priced. Um, and I, I love doing that kind of thing. So um, hopefully some folks will follow up um, and we can we can have some fun with menu analysis. I think it, I'm sure it will happen. Well, I think we probably might be at time. This might not be a bad moment to wrap it up. Sounds I think good. Um, hopefully we'll see you all again very, very soon. Um, and thank you again for a wonderful webinar. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Good luck out there. Bye. <laughs>